Good morning, everyone, and welcome to AXA Arctic Live. It's really, really wonderful to have you all with us today. We have a wonderful live lesson, and it's all about how to survive in the Arctic, and that's with Nick Cox, and we'll be meeting him very, very shortly. It's wonderful to have schools from the UK, Canada, and Ukraine uh, join us this morning. And a couple of points of admin before we get started. For all your questions, please put them in the question uh, and answer app on the Encounter EDU website. If you're watching on YouTube and you'd like to submit questions, the link to the page is in the description for the video. If you would like to have the video full screen and still use the Q&A app, um, then it's always possible to get the live lesson up on another device, such as a smartphone, and then you can pop any questions in there and keep the lesson full screen at the front of the classroom. You can, of course, submit your questions anonymously, um, but if you would like to add a teacher class or school name, that's great. Uh, although we do advise against any personal personal identifying uh, names, especially for young people watching. Uh, if you do have any issues with the stream, uh, there is a live chat button at the bottom right of every single page on the Encounter EDU website. So please click on that and we will try and get your queries or issues sorted as soon as possible. Um, but without further ado, it's my great delight uh, to welcome Nick Cox uh, to Arctic Live. Nick, I was trying to think of the best way of describing you, your 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 job title, because stay station manager, base commander, polar traveler, field guide, maker of things happen. <laughs> I'm not <laughs> sure, Jamie. Jack of many trades, master of none, possibly. I'm not sure, but yes, it's a bit a fairly broad brush. And just before we sort of get, get get into this theme today of surviving in the Arctic and working in the Arctic, um, it'd be wonderful to give classes watching uh, an understanding of, of, of your experience um, in the in the polar regions. You you I mean we talk about apprenticeships. Your apprenticeship was was severe by modern standards. <laughs> what, what, how did you first go south? Well, I, I, I first went to the Antarctic as a, as a 21 year old. So that was rather a long time ago. And uh, things were different then. Um, uh, we all know about the sort of heroic era with Amundsen and Scott and Shackleton and others. Um, Nansen, of course. Um, uh, and then of course, the, the, the next part of the century was taken up with war, sadly. Um, and then after the Second World War, things didn't change enormously through until um, sort of towards the end of the 70s, I would say. Um, so it was a, a reasonably, um, how do I put it, old fashioned way of operating, a very exciting one but uh, not quite the creature comforts that we enjoy in polar regions today. So you, you got a, on a ship, ship in, in, was it Portsmouth or Southampton? Um, and, and, then when, and then when did you come back? Oh, yeah. So I set off in 1975 and was away for just over two and a half years. Um, sailed from Southampton um, with... Uh, pop songs of the time playing and return to a very different world. Um, while we were away, it was the, the, the basis then, um, the heating wasn't quite as good. We got a hundred words every month from our loved ones at home and could send a hundred words by telex. So it was all typed and then sent by the radio operator by telex. And um, the food was pretty, pretty awful. And the clothing was um, nothing like we we have today. But this isn't complaining one bit. It was just absolutely lovely way of life. And um, and I think probably hopefully we'll get across during our discussion this morning is that actually polar regions are very harsh and very difficult, but they're also in some respects quite easy places to live as deserts go. 
And Nick, to, after that first trip in, in the sort of mid mid late late seventies, you've now you've now spent with forty plus years working in or more working in the in the polar polar regions. Yeah, it's uh, for, yeah forty five years now, and um, every year, bar last year, which sadly because of COVID had to miss going, but um, and hopefully get up to the Arctic later on this year. We're going to see how it goes. But so I have missed a year. But other than that, I've been Arctic, Antarctic, or both every year since 1975, which to you youngsters out there will sound like very ancient history. It really, well, it is ancient history. <laughs> um, Nick, you've, you've, you've seen a sort of great, great change. I mean, if you could just sort of describe for, I mean, I don't, don't think anyone watching will probably have been to the Arctic or, or Antarctic. When you first went to the Antarctic and and possibly the Arctic, what? how did it feel? What were your sensations? What, what was it like? Yeah, I think like um, doing a lot of things, whether it's going on holiday somewhere to starting reading a book, you know, you sort of, have a sort of anticipate what it might be like and then find it's full of surprises and certainly going to the the antarctic and to the arctic it holds a lot of surprises you know you you obviously know it's going to be cold and you know it's going to be a lot of white snow and, uh, and all those things and i think when you get there i think the the the, the main thing is how humbling it feels you feel like a very, very tiny dot on a very, very large white piece of paper and, uh, uh, and a very cold white piece of paper. So there's a feeling of being feeling very humble and vulnerable and also feeling very privileged to be able to see it. But I think um, the, the, probably the right attitude, and to this day, you know it, Jamie, being out in the field up in the Arctic, that um, be, feeling vulnerable is a good way to be, just being careful and, and, and you know, comparing it with you youngsters were talk, having the, 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 the joy of talking to this morning. Um, you know, when you go out in a big city, you have to be careful of crossing the roads. And, and there's so many things that you you do automatically or have to think about. And and it's the same in the Arctic and Antarctic, but they're sort of very specialised dangers that you have to watch out for. Nick, we've got a, a few questions coming in, but I, one of the things I'd, I'd love you to talk about before before we we get to those is, I I know one of your favourite things about having been in the polar regions has been working with dogs um, and travelling with dogs. Could could you give a brief sort of uh, beginner's guide to those watching us of how would you travel safely with dogs across um, the Arctic or Antarctic? Well, thank you for that question because um, well, Jamie knows how much I, I do love dogs as so many people do. But, uh, and you, you probably all know that uh, the Inuit um, in Greenland and other parts of the Arctic for very, very, very many years traveled using sledge dogs. We sometimes call them huskies, but uh, to be more specific, we tend to call them a Greenland dog. They're a little bit bigger than your, your husky. And um, we learned from them and over the years have, have, uh, have used them, and we still do, particularly in, in the Arctic. Sadly, they're not in the Antarctic anymore, but they still are up there, up in the Arctic. They're a wonderful way of, of traveling. They've been eclipsed or taken over by motorized transport, by skidoos or snow scooters now. But um, the dogs are still uh, a much um, enjoyed and actually, you know, are a very useful way of, of traveling. But there, it's a, um, it's a slow way of travel, but a very dependable way of travel. They always say with a, with a machine skidoo or snow scooter, um, you can have trouble getting them to start, get the engine to start in the cold, well, it's the opposite with the dogs. It's actually quite difficult to get them to stop sometimes. <laughs> and one of the, the biggest dangers with the dog team is falling off and losing your team. So you have a, a 20 foot, um, I hope this is all right in, in imperial measurements. What would that be? Something like 
five, six meters of rope trailing behind your sledge with a great big, big round knot in the end of it, a monkey's fist knot. So that if you fall off your sledge, you've got something to grab hold of. Because if uh, dogs are really going with gusto and enjoying it, um, they, they, they don't necessarily are going to listen to you and, and, and stop. But they are the most wonderful way of travel. You take them from a, a puppy dog of about 10 weeks old and you put them on a piece of string and they just want to pull. It's bred into them. They pull on the lead. And then when they're about a year old or a little bit older, then we'd start putting them in a team. And uh, typically you'd have nine dogs in a, in a sledge team and they, they're big dogs. They weigh, we had them weighing up to about 52 kilo. So big dogs, I could, I was lighter then, but I could uh, ride on the back of, of my lead dog and uh, just wonderful creatures. In front of a sledge, they'll put all sort of six or 700 kilo and work for an eight hour day and they just just love it just wonderful creatures and and they, i mean one of the things take taking dogs across the antarctic or the arctic it's not like going across a sort of gentle ski slope or 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 like that but there are there are things to to look out for is it easier to to avoid or to work through some of those dangers um with a dog team than it is with a with a skidoo Oh, most definitely. Yes, most definitely. They, they, the, the snow scooter or the skidoo wins for speed because you can go along at 20, 30 kilometers an hour safely. You can go faster than that, but safely maneuver at that sort of speed. And a, a dog team, you know, you're going to be going along at something like, I don't know, um, maybe nine kilometers an hour or something like that at best. Um, it's uh, so it's a, it's a slow way of travel, but it's very dependable. And the lovely thing about dogs is that they are way out in front of you. So you have nine dogs pulling out all on their traces or their long bits of rope, and then you have a twelve foot. So what's that? A four meter long um, sledge, wooden sledge, and then you're at the back of the sledge, shouting commands to the lead dog, who is the dog right out in front, and who you've worked with and uh, you you grow a very close relationship with and train and come to an understanding and they listen to your commands, whether it be to left or the right. So you can maneuver through dangerous areas, whether it be, I mean, the most dangerous, of course, is crevasses, which are big cracks in the ice, which uh, can be meters across um, and can be um, anything up to, you know, 30 to 100 meters or more uh, deep. We, you know, they're just colossal, these holes, and definitely best avoided. Um, sadly, people are killed falling down these holes. But um, with the dogs, they tended to always sense when I was nervous uh, in among crevasses and you're trying to weave in among uh, cracks and holes in the ice. And the lead dog, his ears rather, would go up on top, very close together, pricked up, listening intently for my commands. And I'd say, to go left, I'd say, Err, err. and to go to the right, I'd say, oak, oak, oak. Two, two words that can't be confused, hopefully. And the dog would move and weave very carefully, listening to my commands, and we'd go through and among these holes until hopefully we're on safe territory again. Nick, those two commands were wonderful. I, what I'd love to see is if we, if we can get a few classes around the world practicing some dog commands. So <laughs> if we can do left and right again, and then maybe a couple more, and and just give, give, give a little bit of time after each one, just just so that we have some trainee, um, you know, the dog dog drivers. <laughs> dog drivers. Well, you have have to imagine all these dogs pulling in front of you, lead dog out in front, and you want to go to the left, so you shout. Do you want to give that a go? I hope there's a chorus of eras. And then you want to go to the right. So you, you give a good bellow, and it's oak. Oak, 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 and hopefully your dog will then turn to the right. I 
I'm sure you made a great job there. I wish I could just hear you. It'd be lovely to hear you. <laughs> well, if, if, if anybody, any teachers um, can safely record video um, with the safeguarding, of course, um, we'd love to see those on, on our social media and we'll be shared sure to, to share those across with you nick what, what would be the uh, what one one more sort of very important um command to, that we we mush mush you get sort of like as a common one do you hear and, and that's probably not so is that is that this a sort of a myth um well they do use mush mush i think more in the canadian arctic we tended to just use other words like just hook no hip 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 no and beep. And uh, I even found, this is a very strange quirk of mine, and the colleagues did laugh at me, but I found to shout scrambled eggs at the top of my mouth, scrambled eggs, scrambled eggs, like this, and they got very excited. To be honest, if you say anything with enough excitement in your voice, then they enjoy it, and, and, and you see a, a turn of speed. Brilliant. Nick, thank you so much. Um, just, just some of the questions. I hope everyone in the classroom enjoyed that as much as I did. Um, and maybe in the parks and countryside of the UK, Canada and Ukraine, we'll have scrambled eggs being bellowed um, over the weekend. Um, but um, the question comes through, um, and, and it's about changes. Um, in your experience, do you think the Arctic has changed more or less than the rest of the world? Oh, I would say very much more change in the Arctic than the rest of the world. It really is accelerating so fast up there. Um, you know, I, in world terms, you know, I haven't been going there very long, been going there since to the Arctic since 1978. And, um, but it has changed normally in, enormously in what is actually quite a short time the the temperatures have risen depletion of sea ice uh sea temperatures so much warmer glaciers just retreating almost in front of your eyes you know it's just so fast the retreat of of the ice more and more insects more and more um fish and sea creatures that are arriving from warmer warmer climates um, so yeah, very rapid change, and 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 then of course we get rain. You know, we we would um, wouldn't think of getting a proper downpour of rain in the Arctic, uh, but in the summer now we do, and it's uh, so it's it's a different place to what it was. And Nick, I mean, two examples I know we've spoken about together when we've been in Nalesund, um, that where the UK station is in, in Svalbard. One of which was um, uh, driving across the fjord um in sort of winter and spring with the sea ice and and the second one was is is the island which i think in i think we've we've got the sort of the the peaks behind the station here but on the other side of the fjord that way there was a, something that you thought was part of the mainland but it is now an island an island yeah huge glacier has just retreated and you think of these glaciers you know they're like uh, a slow moving river and you've got the snow inland falling down and uh, accumulating or building up and then slowly but surely um maybe at half a meter a year or something these huge colossal uh blocks of ice are pouring down towards the sea but we have glaciers um local to the station we have one that's moving at about seven meters a day it's moving just uh, so fast and there are fears that it's going to surge because it's building up so much water underneath it it could even accelerate even faster but the sea ice um it's such a lovely uh platform if you like to travel on on sea ice and some of you might have gone on freshwater ice i know you have to be very careful doing these things it's um you know you only do it if the water is really shallow beneath but it's um you'll know that it's hard, like almost like glass, like glass in your window. It's really hard stuff. And if it breaks, it goes in a moment. It just cracks and bang, and it's gone through. Whereas with sea ice, it's, it's very much more elastic. So you can go on to sea ice that we usually reckon we don't go on it until it's at least uh, 12 to 20 centimeters thick. 
you know, we wait till it's got really good thickness. But when those early stages, you can go on and actually it will bend slightly under your feet. And uh, it takes a little while to get used to it, but it's rather like um, being on a, on a bed mattress or on a trampoline. It sort of, you make these hollows where your feet go, but it's so elastic, it is actually safe. Thank you, Nick. Um, we've got wonderful questions. Um, this is from Oscar, who would like to know what equipment do you take with you when you go on expedition? Yeah, now that, that's a really good question, Oscar. I, I mean, it varies a little bit. If you're traveling from the, the base station or the base hut and going out for the day and coming up in the evening, is a bit different to if you're going to be out for two weeks or three months sledge travel, which we do sometimes. So it, it does vary, but there, are, it's a bit like if you go on holiday for a weekend or you go away for three weeks, there are certain things you always take with you. So we always take spare clothing and lots of it, and particularly spare hats, because hats have a habit of blowing away. We get incredibly strong wind forces blowing, and if you lose your hat, um, you can be actually in big trouble. A lot of your heat is lost through your head. So you have to be very careful to have, you know, a couple or even more spare hats with you. And uh, spare mitts, we wear huge mitts to keep our hands warm. We call them bare paw mitts. And they've got artificial fur on the back of the mitt so that if you get a frostbite on your face, then you would hold the fur like this against your the frostbite, and then blow with your mouth just to try and get a little bit of warmth and, and clear it. So if there are two of you traveling together in intense cold, perhaps it's minus 30 degrees centigrade or minus 40 degrees centigrade, or even getting down towards minus 50 degrees centigrade, you watch each other and look for signs of, of uh, frostbite and watch each other. So these big mitts are really, really good and really important. You then have with you... Um, uh, emergency food because you never know what plans plans might change you might find that you've traveled over sea ice and then a bit of sea ice breaks out and you're stuck where you were you might have to stay longer than you thought um so you have sp spare things with you you then got um first aid of course just to in case somebody gets injured or you get injured and then um other bits of clothing Lots of layers. Layers of clothing are the most important. And the, the bits you look after most, of course, are your, your head and your hands and your feet. So typically on our feet, we'd wear uh, three pairs of really thick socks and then two felt boots uh, or felt socks, rather. And then a big muckluck boot on the top of those just to try and keep your, keep your feet warm. But if you're driving with dogs or you're on skis, or basically being fairly energetic, you have to be very careful not to, to, to sweat or perspire, because that makes you wet. And then when you stop, that perspiration will freeze on you. So actually, for the rest of your body, you've got lots on your head, you've got lots on your hands, and lots on your feet. But for the rest of you, try not to wear too much. So when you're underway, you might wear windproof trousers and, and top and, and thermal underwear underneath and a shirt. Um, but actually try and stay fairly cold. It's important just to not get hot. And then as soon as you stop, then you pull on the big jackets and all these other things just to make sure you stay warm. So it's, um, okay, it's a you... sort of fine balance of staying comfortable. Brilliant. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, next question we have is, what is the best thing about living in the Arctic? The best thing about living in the Arctic is the wonderful environment. You look out and it almost makes you giddy. I mean, Jamie, you will agree with this. You, you, you look at this extraordinary landscapes and seascapes, ice, icebergs, which are the most incredible shapes. Um, the skies, you can get aurora in the dark period with these lovely lights in the sky. Um, you get parhelions where you get sun dogs around the sun during the day. And the snow just uh, with its shadows and different colours that you get. It's just absolutely glorious. But the other lovely thing about being in the Arctic is that you're with people 
who are also there to do a serious job, but are also really just bowled over with excitement at seeing the same thing. And it does great things for everybody. And there's a lovely feeling of camaraderie of living together. And because it is a bit dangerous or sometimes very dangerous, that camaraderie of living and being together is uh, all the stronger and, and, and it makes for very good relationships and, and, and uh, yeah, very special place to be. I mean, completely agree. I mean, I've, I've, I've teared up seeing the Aurora. Um, it's, it's, it's so staggeringly beautiful. And, and the, the friendships, as you say, last a lifetime. Bond, bonded in the extreme cold. Yes. <laughs> and, yeah. and last for, for a very long time. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, um, you know, it, it's the old thing. It doesn't matter where what you're doing. Looking after each other and uh, depending on each other is a great thing. It's, uh, it, 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 as you say, Jamie, it forges friendships that just last and last and last. Um, the ne next question, there's, there's a little bit on, on, on wildlife, um, but have you, um, first of all, what different kinds of wildlife have you encountered? Oh, um, st starting in the Antarctic, there, of course, there is just million upon million of penguins, which are just lovely. Um, the lovely thing about the Antarctic is man has never lived there. I mean, we visit we explore and we come away, but human beings have never lived in the Antarctic. So the animals there really don't know any fear. They don't see man as anything particularly unusual. We wander around looking like rather large penguins. And, um, and, so, and that's very sort of humbling in a way and, 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 and lovely. So, you know, you have a Weddell seal, which is about three meters long, lying there with the pup suckling milk and you can go up and and sort of crouch down beside them and the pup will look up at you and go mwah, mwah, mwah. and it's just delightful you feel so privileged to be beside these animals and the penguins will wander by you or even come up and give you a beating up i've had them come up and with their little flippers go like this and beat you up in the knees and look up at you squawking and um or if you sit long enough one might come and uh, bring you a stone because when they're looking for a mate, they carry a stone and present it to another penguin. And if the penguin takes it, then they're married. That's it. They're, they're, they're a, 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 a couple. And if you sit long enough, you might be lucky enough to get married to a penguin if one comes and <laughs> gives a stone to you. So, you know, it's just delightful. Uh, you know, the creature's just lovely to see and, and so, so tame. In the, in the Arctic, of course, they have been hunted by the Inuit and others, not today, but in the past. Um, but So they are a little bit more timid, but they're also timid because they do have this one big predator, which, of course, is the, the, the polar bear. So all the animals up there, including us, are quite, are quite nervous of the polar bear. But the polar bears, they're, they're lovely. I mean, I've seen hundreds of polar bears. I've only been chased by one, and, and that was fair enough. It was a mum with a very tiny little cub. You would have loved to see it. It was the most perfect little cub walking along beside her mum. Beside her mum. And they were on the sea ice, and uh, I was way away. I mean, you know, I didn't think they would notice me, to be honest. I was on the land quite a distance away. But the mother did see me and just turned, and they run so fast and very low and came up, and it wasn't a drama, it wasn't a problem. I uh, turned and thankfully the snow scooters started because um, they were a bit unreliable, certainly were then, pulling on this string cord to try and get this thing started. And thankfully it started. The mother actually still came at me despite the noise of the motor and was very close, but the cub ran away and she turned to go off with the cub. So that was fine. Mostly polar bears, they'll look at you, um, and and find you sort of interesting and then carry on they're, they're most wonderful creatures they um just it's their kingdom they're um there's food for them there they're very relaxed creatures really um and and just so lovely to see 
And then, of course, we get the foxes up there and go into these huge white coats during the uh, the winter months. And, uh, and of course, in the winter up there, of course, it's 24-hour darkness. We have 24-hour light through the summer and 24-hour darkness in the winter. So there they are, the foxes and some of the bears. Some of the bears uh, hibernate, particularly the females. But they, um, the foxes, there they are, wandering around in the dark, looking for things, caches of food that they've hidden during the summer. It's a very, very tough existence for them. And then in the sea, of course, we get the white whales, the beluga whales, who are rather like a big dolphin and, and white, and they don't have a dorsal fin. You know, the big fin on their back, or which you'd find on a dolphin, of course. Well, they don't have one on a, on a, um, on a beluga whale, but they're very, very beautiful. Um, and occasionally we see the blue whale, which is uh, the largest mammal that's ever lived on Earth, so just enormous it's just uh, unbelievable to see one of these fine creatures rolling out to sea very slowly or appears very slowly anyhow they say that the tongue of a uh, of a of an of a, a blue a blue whale weighs the same as an elephant they are just so big they're just colossal Nick, thank you so much for that sort of overview of some of the marvellous wildlife in the polar regions. The next question is, uh, did you have any dangerous encounters with wildlife? And I think you've touched on that with uh, the polar bear. Um, but perhaps you could just maybe give a quick uh, polar bear safety briefing for our young audience watching. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the best thing with polar bears, of course, is to avoid danger. Well, it goes with anything, doesn't it, really? Uh, just try and, and avoid getting yourself into a situation where where the, where the bear might attack you. And usually bears attack. We, sometimes if they're a bit frightened, they can cause an attack. And then, of course, if they're very, very hungry. So what I always say to people when they're before they go out into the field, out into the wilderness for the first time, um, is most bears will pass you by. Get into a group, stand in a group of people, so they're, they're more likely to, or rather, less likely to attack if there's a group of people standing together. And try and get downwind so that, that the smell of yourself doesn't drift over to the polar bear. But then if a bear does approach, you have to make some difficult decisions. And one is to use a flare pistol, which sends an explosive flare, and that makes a very loud bang, which would scare them away, hopefully. And then if it, it this very rarely happens and has never happened at our base camp, but uh, it, it does very occasionally happen where people have had, sadly had to shoot polar bears, but um, we would try and do anything, anything possible to avoid doing that but the the four types of bear that are most likely to attack are the one i just mentioned just now the mother with a with a cub because they're defending their cubs and that's fair enough they're they're doing what they should do defending the young ones and then the next one is the the cubs that have just left their mum now the, the cubs stay with their mum for two years and they the the uh, bears have usually have two cubs. Both don't always survive, but quite often you see them wandering along with two two-year-old cubs. So they're really quite big, but they're still with the mother. Then after the two years, they leave the mother, but they're not very good at coping on their own. And uh, they get hungry and they also get scared. Um, so they, you have to be really careful. If you see a young young bear, you've got to be very very careful to get out of the way because they they are that bit more likely to to attack you. And then of course the other one, of course, is very old bears. The other extreme, very very old bears. Their teeth a bit like me. Teeth getting a bit square, and uh, um, they can't run as fast as they could to catch seal, which is their main diet. So they get. So they get rather gaunt and skinny. And uh, if they do see a human being who can't run very fast, uh, they're more likely to attack just because they're so desperate to get food. And then the fourth one is actually the one to be really watching out for all the time. And that, uh, it sounds very strange, this, but actually it's a, a sleeping polar bear. 
because polar bears sleep an enormous amount of the time, particularly in the summer months when it's uh, warm for them, warm temperatures for them. And they drop down and fall asleep anywhere. They don't look for somewhere comfy. They just drop down and a bit like a pet dog, uh, sort of curl around with the nose underneath the back leg and, and, and snooze. And I've had it said to me that if you called a day one hour, you a, a polar bear would be sleeping for something like 50 to 55 minutes, you know, if you called that a day. So in one day, they're asleep for a lot of the time, and then they're up hunting and finding some food. So we have to be very careful not to wake up a bear. And sometimes we've had to creep to get in to get to our boats that are on the shore because there's a polar bear sleeping not very far away. Or you see one lying there and you have to take a big detour around so that you don't wake them. Because when you, if you do wake one, they, they, they're a bit grumpy, like a lot of us. When we first wake up, we'd rather have a bit more snooze. But they, get, they can get rather, rather, rather scared and, uh, and, and are more likely to attack. Yeah. Nick, thank you very much. The next question, very interesting, um, which is asking, does climate change scare you? No, it doesn't scare, but it it um, worries a little bit for the for the future. Um, you know, we've adapted over hundreds and hundreds of years. Human beings have adapted to a changing world, all sorts of reasons, and hopefully, we'll adapt to climate change. But it is happening quite quickly. Um, so we're going to have to be quick on our feet and very adaptable to, you know, uh, to put up with these changes because there are going to be some. But no, they don't um, don't scare me. There's one plus side to global warming, um, and that is it actually pulls us all together. Everyone in the world has got this problem that we've got to deal with, and and actually working together on a problem can be, you know, a very good thing. Makes us sort of all get on and, and do these things. So, yeah, we've got a lot of work to do um, to, to, to try and reduce global warming. And, and of course, we're going to have to put up with changes, but um, we will, and, um, and we'll keep the planet in good shape, I hope. Thank you, Nick. Um, a question here, going, going back to the dogs um, conversation we had earlier, is asking what kind of dangers the dogs face yeah, the dogs um, in the Antarctic, the dogs, of course, the crevassing, which I mentioned, that that is the biggest uh, uh, danger for them, um, you know, because the crevasses are covered by, very often covered by snow. They, it's called a bridge. So there's a, a sort of a half a metre of, of snow that's covering. So you just don't see where the crevasses are. So you're going along and selling boom and... Uh, a dog is dropped down through a bridge because they're in front of you. Sometimes it would be more than one dog and they've all popped down holes and they're swinging on their traces down this blue abyss. And you would anchor the sledge and then work your way forward with your ice axe, break a hole to look down into the crevasse. And you'd see these poor dogs swinging down there. And sometimes it was two dogs that actually didn't like each other very much. And it was quite funny, really, because you'd see them swinging like this. And when they came close together, they start growling at each other, like this, growling at each other. So you'd be shouting down the hole, suka, suka, quiet, quiet, attack, quiet, quiet, just to try and tell them to behave themselves while they're, they're still. And then you'd pull them out and keep going. So they, they were fine, but, but that is a danger. And then in, in the... In the Arctic, of course, the polar bear, because polar bears um, are quite inquisitive or very inquisitive, so they tend to come close to dogs. They don't usually attack, but there are occasionally times when um, the dogs are attacked by the polar bear. The other danger for <clears throat> both North and South, Antarctic and Arctic, is uh, sea ice travel. Um, and occasionally they fall down what we call leads, and that's where you get just cracks in the ice and if you go fast enough dogs and sledges they all jump over and the sledge goes over and it's fine there's open water in these cracks but occasionally you get a dog that just drops in one of these holes and you have to pull them out and sort of 
get as much water off them as you can and get them running again to warm them up. But uh, so the dangers are not great, but actually I would say crevassing is probably the worst one. Thank you very much, Nick, for that. Um, next question, um, which we can talk about, was does living in the Arctic uh, make you not like living in the city again? And I know you don't you don't live live in a city, but I think you probably get the gist of the of the yeah, question. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, that's a great question. Um, I just love being with people. I'm sure you all do as well. So to be in the city, I you know enjoy it. I mean, I love countryside and I love open spaces. But um, no, I, I, I love being in the city and um, and uh, seeing people all communicating and living as they do at close quarters. And um, yeah, no, I think wherever we are, it's exciting. Um, thank you. Just out of interest, when when what, what, what's the first thing you notice different about being back in a city? after being in the polar regions? Um, yes, the, the things that you find uh, different. One, funny enough, is actually seeing children because you don't get many children go to the Arctic and the Antarctic. So you can go very, very long time without seeing children. And that's just a joy. And to hear laughter